Um, in fact, the first TubeSat was launched to orbit in 2017. It was built by a group of middle school students in South America. Um, and they uh, acquired um, some launch space on, um, on a Japanese rocket, I believe, and um, got it flown to the International Space Station where it was deployed in 2017 and worked perfectly. So we were very happy about that. And uh, we, um, we think that it's a fantastic opportunity for students, even, even uh, college students. I'm, I'm planning to build one of these uh, in graduate school. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna take a modified nano satellite kit and I'm gonna do an independent study project on that um, pretty soon. So um, it's a great learning experience for kids because you get programming experience, electrical engineering experience, um, turning a wrench, all kinds of other stuff, including uh, looking for marketing, fundraising, team building, leadership. Um, I could show you a, a brochure we're looking for. Okay, actually, great. if you have a moment. Thank you, Sean. I will. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Anything good? <laughs> and, and astronaut. Engineering mm -hmm. with management. It is part of the Purdue Master of Engineering Management program. Purdue MEM. Uh, and if you need more information about that, I can, I can refer you to my advisor, Eric Vandenborg, who would love to talk to you. Okay, super. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. If you think of any more questions, feel free to ask. And if you need any more takes of that, okay. you know, I, that's it's very rare that I get everything in one take like that. Oh, yeah, you did great. You did great. <laughs> take bits and pieces, but okay. really cool. Fantastic. I hope it was okay. What about inter interorbital? How do you fit into interorbital? Orbital. So I, um, like I said, I'm a graduate student at Purdue University, so I was looking to get some experience in the aerospace industry. I wanted to find out how somebody runs an aerospace company. In fact, I really wanted to find out how someone could start their own aerospace company and compete against multinational conglomerates across the world that have billions of dollars. And I, was, and I didn't understand how a small company could start and compete with that. And then I found in orbital systems and I talked to Randa a little bit and found out really just what a strong leader she is, especially as a woman in this industry, um, to, to put up with the adversity and that sort of thing. And I wanted to come out here and see exactly what she does. So I've basically been interning. I started off as a uh, spacecraft technician out there and we did some upper stage engine tests. It was extremely rewarding experience. I can show you some videos. Um, and then lately I've been acting a little bit more as uh, her personal assistant. Um, and working on business development, learning a little bit more about um, the marketing and sales side of running this company, and um, including making partnerships um, with uh, people in the industry so that we can achieve our goals. And our goal is to um, our goal is to produce an orbital vehicle and have an orbital demonstration. End of 2019 is our goal. That's an aggressive timeline that we've set out to do that. Um, but we definitely can do it by the end of 2019 or 2020, depending on when we get the funding. So, uh, very exciting time at Interval Systems. Which uh, launch platform are you going to use? Which launch platform? Yeah. What do you mean by that? Well, what's going to take your vehicle up to space? Right. It's called the Neptune Series Rocket. It's an iOS design. Okay. Um, it, like I said, it's an expandable modular rocket system based on a common propulsion module. Um, which is the uh, booster stage, and it's going to be launched. It's designed to be able to launch from a mobile land system or a mobile um, ocean launch system. Uh -huh. And so we don't need any like huge multi-million dollar infrastructure like at Kennedy or even any of the other smaller um, launch places like in Wallops, Kodiak, Vandenberg. We can launch from basically what it comes down to is a modified uh, a modified trailer that, um, I mean, it's transportable and we can take it anywhere we want to and launch it anywhere as long as we uh, get it cleared with the FAA. So. <laughs> We're in the middle of the night, whatever. Well, yeah, you know. You know yeah. you, uh, and that'll put one, one satellite up or many? Satellites. So the Neptune One, that's the smallest launch vehicle in the Neptune series fa in the Neptune family of rockets. Um, that uh, is designed to launch 20 kilograms to low Earth orbit, approximately 500 kilometers polar orbit. 
polar um, low earth orbit. Um, but like I said, it's an expandable modular system. So we have a series of these rocks designed, the N1, the N3, the N5, and an N8. We also have some other designs, but those are the first ones. And they are designed um, around the common propulsion module. So basically you just have to bundle these common propulsion modules into different flight configurations. And that's going to allow you to make progressively more powerful launch vehicles. Um, to go to customize orbits still at an extremely uh, short launch schedule and um, launch on demand, rapid response. Some things that are important to the military, things that are important to um, satellite customers that are losing money, frankly, every time one of their satellites stops working or falls out of orbit, they need to get that satellite back up there really quick. And that's what, we're that's what our rocket is designed to do. I see. And who, who are the users on a regular basis? The regular basis? Yeah. Specifically, people that have um, satellite constellations, small satellite constellations, which are becoming much more popular right now. Um, for example, um, well, let's see. I don't, I don't want to throw out a whole bunch of names or anything like that, but basically... Um, I don't well, know just generic. I mean, do you, is it military or is it communications? or, um, or is There's it, a lot of different applications, if I'm being honest. Um, in terms like there's constellations that uh, predict weather patterns, there's constellations that can track shipping routes um, and track ships throughout the ocean, make sure nobody gets lost out there. Um, there's satellites that uh, measure uh, the interaction of the Earth's magnetic field with uh, solar wind. Um, there's all kinds of projects, including remote sensing, just um, sending images back to the Earth just to track things that are on your land, on your property, for people that have a lot of property and that sort of thing and need to keep track of their assets. And um, specifically, uh, an important thing is the Internet of Things, which I don't know how much you know about the Internet of Things, but it's basically it's basically um, interconnected uh, things like your fridge or your microwave could have a little chip in it and they would communicate with each other and tell each other how effectively they're running and they would be able to work in conjunction with each other. They would know when you're going to use power, that sort of thing. You could also, you can also track um, remote assets. So even like farmers can track the health of their cows in their pasture from space using little uh, RFID chips, I believe. And uh, we would be able, like, with a with a constellation, they call it, a, a group of small satellites, some nano satellites. You could track remote assets all over the all over the country, all over the world, and um, basically the the data that that produces is able to be monetized, and and it's it helps companies um, it helps companies to make their products more effective for their customers and to get more value for their customers, basically. Mm -hmm. Wow. Sean, so do you work for these guys? Or are you still interning? Um, I'm working for them now. I wouldn't I would say, say they'd be crazy if they didn't hire you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good job. Thank you. Oh, man. OK, you guys put me on the Very spot. Very nice. Oh, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we have. We have a flight manifest of 152 of these ready to go right now. Oh, really? Already been bought, and most of them, I'm not sure if they've all been uh, finished uh, construction yet. You know, right. each, each team, their their launch schedule is, they have their own launch schedule, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, the point is that this cube set would be about the size of this right here. Uh huh. And yeah. uh, so <clears throat> a cube set typically of this size, a standard 1U is going to be 1.33 kilograms. Mm hmm. So that means that somewhere shy of 15 uh, would fit in the Neptune 1. Wow. Yeah. Uh-oh, I better do the math on that. But 20 kilograms the Neptune 1 takes divided by 1.33. Close enough. Close somewhere enough. Range, yeah, right? approximately. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, yeah, so this was their, uh, this is the GPRE engine that is used on the uh, Neptune family of vehicles. Okay. This was test... <coughs> Excuse me. This was test fired in 2012 yeah. originally. Sure. Then they flight tested it here on the CPM test vehicle. Okay. So this is the CPM. This is the basic building block of the rest of the Neptune mm -hmm. series of rockets. Got it. 
And um, this was a fantastic, I mean, look how gorgeous the, we use uh, white fuming nitric acid and turpentine. Oh yeah. Relatively green hypergolic fuels. Mm -hmm. um, they, uh, they react spontaneously when, when, the, when the liquids touch each other, they spontaneously combust. I see. So there's no need for a, a separate ignition system or anything like that. And it's little things like that that basically have helped in orbital systems keep their costs extremely low compared mm -hmm. to competitors. Sure. And it's basically what's going to allow them to become the world's, um, the world's lowest costing orbital vehicle. Um, now, the altitude on this. Mm-hmm. Oh, you know, I'm not sure of the exact altitude. Um, in fact, I don't even I don't even want to speculate as to how high it went. It was okay. in 2014. I wasn't here. Uh huh. Um, so I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure about that. But but the uh, the modules, how high are they going to be when they so these are circulate? Modules, these modules are intended to go anywhere between uh, 300 and 500 kilometers. Okay. Um, that's low Earth orbit. And yeah. The nice part about that is when they're in, when they're at around 300, 350 kilometers, there's still a little bit of atmosphere up there, which uh -huh. allows the satellites that create some drag, and they naturally deorbit themselves, which is which is actually intended. So there's not a bunch of space debris left up there, and you don't have to track them for um, too too long a period of time before you know that it's safe to go in that area again. So sure. that is what people like, actually, um, is that they yeah. uh, deorbit themselves and they don't have to cut. There's a lot of licensing things. Like, if you're going to have something that orbits up there for several years, you have to have a special license for that. So I see. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So Good. these things are going to yeah, deorbit themselves go? at about 350 kilometers. But they can go up. The Neptune 1 is designed to go up to 500 kilometers. But if they need to go higher, that's when you uh, that's when you go ahead and get on the Neptune three. That's I see. It's gonna be a little bit more powerful vehicle. Gonna be made of three common propulsion modules like this that are gonna be bundled bundled together, together. in a figure in a figure of three. Basically, there's two. Basically, there'd be two. Sure. Two sure. Side sure. Ones. Sure. It would launch right. Right. Stage one separation. The two on the outside are gonna so, break off. Then yeah. the one in the middle takes off. Right. It keeps going. That's right. And then out here in the top, there's two upper stages up there in the top that okay. uh, take it to the rest of the spot. There's okay. Two. Now is interorbital a publicly held company? Uh, it is a privately time? closely held company. Um, at the moment. At the moment, yes, but it is incorporated. Okay. Mm -hmm. So interorbital plans to to offer stock publicly? Uh, absolutely. Um, we have a we have some investors and we are uh, in discussions with with more investors right now. Sure. Uh, of course, we're looking for some funding to uh, to push to push the timeline to make their timeline um, yeah make it a little bit faster. Sure. Um, the thing is, interorbital systems has gone for 20 years plus with an extremely low budget um, and we and they consider that to be one of their competitive advantages is how much they've been able to do with so little money yeah so we don't want too much money you know but we're willing well, it's we're, true. We're absolutely it's willing true to it is a problem yeah and we are yeah and we uh, we encourage them to reach out to us sure sure reach so out our, to me hi I'm Sean Wainwright yeah we're ready to start it's incredible innovation and thought-provoking technological disruptors and aerospace feats that most in their lifetime will never see or experience. I, for one, was completely in dismay once I learned of all that existed right here in my very own backyard. As you can probably tell from my accent, I'm not from here. But once coming here, the, the amount of aerospace and the amount of technology, the amount of thought, the, thought-provoking conversations that I have had have completely blown me, uh, me away and I've encouraged so much self-growth that I am so, so very excited to announce to you that we, along with the Antelope Valley College Associated Student Association, um, will be bringing to you a speaker series of thought leaders just like Ms. Randa Miller. Randa is the CEO and co-founder of Interorbital Systems. She is, they are a satellite and, and, I'm so sorry, satellite and rocket manufacturer based at the Mojave Air and Space Port. Her work, um, well, she's going to present on STEM technology and I'm so sorry, education of the new space movement and the small satellite revolution taking place right here in the Antelope Valley. Interorbital provides satellite kits that are the center of curricula in academic programs in well over 25 countries. 
And with that, we welcome Ms. Milliron to the stage. Good afternoon. And welcome to the Small Satellite Revolution. How many of you know what uh, the small satellites look like, the CubeSats and the TubeSats? Okay. Okay, great. Good. And uh, uh, I've been involved in this arena, as it were, for the last uh, 10 years when the new type of satellites, these new form factors, which I just so happen to have nearby, uh, came into existence. Uh, they're, they're handheld satellites. And any of you who have worked with the massive satellites know the difference. Uh, one the size of a Greyhound bus, the other a tiny coffee can. So, so things are changing in the industry. And uh, because they are, these are so affordable and uh, still technologically complex, they become uh, fantastic tools for STEM education. So you can, in fact, learn the black arts of satellite making with our kits, and then we'll launch them for you. So this is a tube set. <coughs> a more conventional or more well-known cube set. This is called one unit. Uh, these come in a variety of uh, configurations for flight or for various missions. You can generally expand these to uh, three, a three U or a three unit is uh, very popular for Earth observation. And instead of having to spend billions of dollars on a satellite, uh, you can spend, uh, well, a few tens of thousands and get similar performance, which is uh, extraordinary. Uh, that's, that's due largely to uh, the advances in uh, microelectronics, and so um, many of those uh, components made specifically for this new type of satellite. Uh, I represent a company called Interorbital Systems, and that's, um, that's a company that's been in in operation since uh, 1995 at the uh, Mojave Air and Space Port. Uh, in order to have a, a small satellite revolution, you also need to have a, a revolution in the type of launch vehicle that to, delivers these to orbit. So it's, it's, uh, it's a package, essentially. And uh, we have been working on, uh, on a new class of of launchers. They're dedicated small satellite launchers. Uh, our rocket is called the Neptune. It's a Neptune series of uh, uh, increasingly larger vehicles that uh, are made of uh, modular units that are mass produced very inexpensively. And so uh, it's actually going to be the world's least expensive orbital launcher when we commence our services. Uh, next summer, going through licensing now and final testing. But uh, it's, it's a very exciting time for the company and a very exciting time to be a student involved in, in this type of science and engineering. The opportunities are fantastic. I mean, how many of you have uh, ever had the chance or the offer to, uh, say, an elementary school or middle school or high school or even college to be able to make your own satellite. I, mean, it's, I don't think that happens very often. I know that I would have jumped at the chance uh, when I was in uh, middle school. And um, we have uh, examples of, of groups from middle schools, and one in Brazil who actually had their TubeSat uh, launched on a Japanese rocket, taken to the ISS, the International Space Station, it was deployed from there, and that was our first uh, hardware in orbit, and it was the first tube set in orbit. And for these kids, you know, who were generally 11 and 12, it was a fantastic coup 
you know, to have achieved that kind of you know, technological superiority and, and uh, prowess at, at that young age. So I can only imagine what's, you know, what's going to happen in their lives after getting that high at 11. I would think there will be many, many satellite companies that come from that, uh, that great uh, program. But uh, on the slide, you can see some of our facilities at the, uh, the Air and Spaceport, which, uh, which, by the way, is uh, one of the only places in the world that offers uh, this type of, uh, of uh, freedom to do rocket engine testing and, and uh, uh, also flight testing for other, uh, some of the other companies who are using air launch. Uh, it's a very, very unique location, and uh, anybody who's interested should stop by and uh, tour, the, tour the area. You'll see the center of, uh, of what is the new commercial space movement, uh, like, like no other center in the world, within, within a few feet of each other, most of the main companies who are, who are making, the, uh, uh, making that new space movement happen are, uh, are headquartered. So really, uh, quite an exciting place, quite vibrant. Uh, at, at our uh, facility in Mojave, uh, we have two rocket engine test sites that, that we built over the years, uh, basically starting with an you know, open piece of flat desert and uh, put in the requisite uh, items that you need if you're doing rocket testing, like a blockhouse and uh, test stands and all the, uh, well, the, I guess it's the hardware and software uh, potential for measuring the results of the testing that you're doing there. So we have underground cabling and uh, video and uh, drones and everything that you might need to capture uh, some of the, uh, the fantastic uh, engine firings that, uh, that go on there and uh, then be able to review that uh, to, you know, to capture those images and study your, study your work to see what can be improved. So that, um, that engine firing you see at the bottom, that's a 24 foot long photo. And that's a, that's a qualification test for our, uh, what's our main engine in most of the Neptune uh, series rockets. So we, uh, we cluster modules, very much like the ones that you see in the upper right. Uh, and um, with those, we can meet any mission requirement, uh, depending on what, uh, what needs to be lifted and to where it needs to be lifted. So that, that rocket at the bottom that you see, that's a, that's a propellant mixture that is uh, uh, historic. It was uh, used... Uh, in the past, and we've revived its use with some uh, additions. Uh, it's white fuming nitric acid and turpentine. Now, this I think sounds odd that we would be making uh, making rocket engines that fire on uh, you know, what your local artist might use to clean his or her brushes. Uh, but uh, turpentine's a hydrocarbon, very much like kerosene or any of the other rocket repellents, and it's, uh, uh, when it's burnt with uh, nitric acid, you get this beautifully luminous glowing plume that is extremely stable, and when you're making a rocket engine to uh, deliver delicate instruments to outer space, you want your engines to be operating smoothly and efficiently. Okay. That's why we test them on the ground like this, it's called a hot fire test. Uh, that is uh, it's a, as exciting as it looks. And actually, later I'll show you some video of, uh, of these tests and some of the launches that we've done. Uh, but the, uh, as I mentioned, the satellite revolution doesn't happen without the small satellite launch vehicle, the dedicated vehicle. Uh, so uh, this, is, this is what we concentrate on. And we're a unique company because we fund ourselves through the sales of our satellite kits and launches. And uh, that is uh, 
Uh, we're not dependent on any government agency. We are strictly commercial. The government is our customer in many cases, but we're not waiting for a handout, essentially. If you uh, take a look at the satellites in the center there, there's a tube set made by a Mexican university and arts group uh, that is uh, called their Ulysses satellite. That's a tube set. And they've, uh, they've monetized every square inch of that spacecraft by using uh, the, the aluminum strips, the cooling strips on the sides there as uh, billboards for sponsors. So um, they've, they've actually done a, a great job in uh, being able to self-fund their program. I mentioned the size of satellites in, in the past. These are the only types of satellites you could find. You see that little tiny person up there? Uh, that's how gigantic that satellite is. It's, it's not only gigantic in size, but it's gigantic in price. And these are hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars that are uh, uh, pushed into these, these, uh, these huge uh, communications satellites. Um, which, uh, in all fairness, must be huge because they need to hold a, a large amount of propellant. Their, their lifespan is dependent on how well they can do their station keeping or their, keep their place in space, and that requires thrusters and propellant to uh, power those thrusters. So uh, one of the factors in, the, in making a, uh, uh, you know, an asset like that is um, to make sure that it's going to have a good long lifespan because of the massive investment in it. And uh, usually, if you have a, a satellite that costs hundreds of millions or billions of dollars, you have a launch cost that's also in that same range. So it becomes a massive investment. Uh, what, what's happening now, and in the last uh, 10 years, is the move uh, to the small. And and again, uh, these satellites are very, very tiny. I mean, who, would, who would think that something like this, you know, could function as a, maybe a, an amateur radio node at 310 kilometers. People could bounce signals off this, or that it could do work for you. Uh, maybe three of these in a line with a telescope inside. You can do Earth observation. You can gather uh, actionable intelligence, as they like to say in, the, in marketing, to go out and uh, see what's what with crops or forests or uh, other real-time uh, activities. Uh, maybe you want to see what's happening in a disaster zone. Maybe you want to uh, see what kind of uh, saltwater incursion is happening in a certain area into fresh water. You would be able to, with the proper sensors on these satellites, get that information in real time. And the, the orbit that these uh, satellites go into is one that uh, they travel from pole to pole. They go uh, to the south, to the south pole, come back up over the north pole, and uh, continue in uh, what's called a circular polar orbit. Uh, they go over the entire Earth. Uh, usually you'll get three good uh, chances to communicate with your satellite per day. Uh, so you can upload or download data. And that is, um, that is really an advantage if your business or the information that you sell or the data, data that you sell uh, needs to be the freshest. So, the ideal thing for many companies is to have their own satellite constellation instead of uh, having to try to find, again, billions of dollars to set up a conventional satellite system. Uh, you can now, with uh, satellites of this size, uh, create what's called an array or a constellation and each of these satellites becomes a node in that constellation so that it does some function. If it happens to 
it'll be damaged or destroyed, uh, you can assign its activities to some other element in that array, just like you would do in a robotic swarm. So it's uh, really a, uh, a beautiful solution to what would be in, in a monolithic, gigantic satellite, a death sentence for that that's piece of hardware. In a constellation, you can replace and replenish uh, those satellites fairly easily and fairly cheaply. Uh, you wouldn't want to have to replace, a, say, a $2 billion asset. Uh, that would be uh, ruinous to most companies. So um, the new trend, again, is, is, is down, downward in size and um, upward in terms of how many of the components there might be in the satellites. You may have seen some of the, the new satellite concepts that are, that are coming out, um, uh, which have hundreds of satellites in those constellations. But again, they're working, uh, they're working in unison, and they are uh, uh, working uh, or, or doing similar work to what one uh, former big iron satellite would be doing. So that is, um, you know, that's, that's the trend, again. And I remember talking with the people who invented these satellites, uh, uh, Bob Twiggs and uh, Jordi uh, Hoi-Swari. Uh, Bob's from uh, Stanford and, uh, and Jordi's from uh, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. They created these small satellites and people laughed at them. First, they said, what are you going to be able to do with that? You know, what's that toy you have? And things rapidly changed that within a decade, every government agency, the military, uh, corporate uh, America, and the world, uh, basically everyone, and academia, wanted to get in on this action. So all satellite work is, is now uh, not focused. You still have uh, some of the, the huge satellites because there's need for those, but not as much as for the innovative programs that are being run on these constellations of small satellites that are far more affordable than the, uh, the giant ones were. Uh, as I mentioned, we have uh, students of all ages. These are some actual, these are actual customers of ours. Uh, there are uh, a, uh, a wide variety of, uh, again, there are 25 countries, and uh, you have people from every walk of life working uh, to make their own personal satellites. Uh, in the upper left is a, is a school in Miami uh, that uh, started, uh, started with a uh, single tube set kit and has made several, but they uh, they were talking about the fact that they were kind of an impoverished school and uh, uh, it was kind of a depressing area and a depressed area. Uh, but when they introduced this satellite program, all the children involved in it suddenly had a new swagger, they said. They, had, they were proud that they were in that satellite program, building spacecraft. So it's, it's uh, not only the fact that they're learning new skills and they're in a cutting edge sector and the fastest growing sector, I might add, of the aerospace industry. Uh, it, was, it was just the thrill of being involved in something space. Uh, they, um, they successfully uh, used that uh, satellite uh, to transmit images. And, and again, this is a very, very tiny and not, not a hugely powerful <coughs> satellite. And so to, to be able to work within the constraints of the form factor, the size, and the limited power is, is an, it's a really fantastic uh, exercise in ingenuity and innovation uh, to be able to make this thing work. Because it can do whatever you like it to do if you're clever enough to figure out how to tell it what to do for you. So, uh, they, they did a great job on that, and uh, as you go down the left, uh, left side there, <coughs> excuse me, the, um, the girls at the bottom, uh, that's a photograph from a group called Meadow in South Africa, and it's 
it's an outreach for women uh, uh, in the, the locale there to uh, get the skills to pull themselves out of their economic situation and into a new way of life. So they are doing uh, soldering there. And they started with uh, some of our tube set kits, learned the, learned the skills required because the, when you get a kit, you also get a uh, very, very complicated, complex and uh, uh, straightforward complex uh, guide uh, on how to assemble these, uh, these uh, satellites. And they're not trivial. It's not like you snap them together. It's not that type of thing. These are, these are kits in which you need to learn uh, several types of soldering. You need to be able to do basic programming. Uh, you have to uh, be able to uh, make, make orders for printed circuit boards from basic Gerber files, or these are, these are the files from which you make a printed circuit board, that, uh, or make modifications. Uh, to the craft, if you wanted to do something different than just a basic function, uh, you have to learn how to uh, send and receive uh, uh, radio signals. Uh, so many of the people are, are involved in the amateur radio world, uh, and the, these satellites, because they're experimental, uh, run on the amateur band. Uh, so there are many, many, many aspects to this. That are that are positive in terms of in terms of learning various skills, also social skills, because these are these kids are really secretly team building uh, exercises. If you don't have someone in your group who can do uh, the uh, soldering, or you don't have somebody who can do programming, it's your job to go out and find that person in your community. So it, it becomes uh, you know an interesting. Uh, uh, socializing kind of experiment as well. Uh, the girl in the center is, uh, is part of the group in the upper right. That's the Brazilian group from Uva Tuba Elementary School, the Tancredo School. And the central bottom picture there <coughs> is, um, is Tancredo 1, their tube set being deployed in a uh, special uh, two pod, which is a uh, deployment system for tube sets exclusively. Uh, to the right, you see a um, an Austrian arts group and their tube set done as a work of art. Uh, above them, above that picture, is uh, uh, two fellows from the Naval Postgraduate School uh, with their tube set. So it's really, uh, really across the board, all ages. Uh, can benefit, and so uh, this platform and this on-orbit platform that is incredibly cheap. In fact, that satellite kit and launch is priced at an academic low price of eight thousand dollars. So that's that can't be matched anywhere in the world. We can do that because we've made the rocket that is the cheapest rocket in the world, and we launch between uh, twenty and fifty of these small satellites for launch. So it's a kind of a quantity thing that allows us to do that. Um, there are higher prices for military or uh, regular corporate clients, but we want to keep our academic pricing down so that we can spread this knowledge. Um, I have right now 152 of these kits waiting for launch. They're in some level of build. Now it looks tiny up there, but uh, if you look at our website uh, at interorbital.com, you can see the launch manifest and all the customers we have. As you can see, there are there are many and varied groups, uh, ranging from <coughs> excuse me, uh, from NASA to the Moldovan University to uh, Manhattan Satellite. Harmony School of Excellence, Base 11, which uh, caters to uh, uh, low-income but high-potential students in the LA area, and um, 
many, many uh, groups and large corporations like MITRE Corporation and IBM are also using these to uh, do uh, low-cost space testing and also uh, to, uh, to really uh, look, at, look at them as platforms for, again, expanded use in, in constellations or private networks of various sorts. So in order to uh, make this low-cost satellite program happen, uh, we have to have that low-cost rocket. So the uh, common propulsion module, which is what we call uh, each uh, kind of Lego for this, these components, it's the building block, it's the basic unit. It consists of a uh, rocket engine, set of propellant tanks, a brain, and uh, it can serve as a standalone, uh, standalone uh, sounding rocket or a research rocket. Here you see it on its uh, portable launcher, which uh, can make really any location a launch pad. And it's made to be launched uh, with a very, very small component from between two to five people and a laptop are all that's needed to launch this rocket. Uh, it is uh, radically simplifying many of the systems that would normally uh, be considered uh, you know, absolutely necessary in a rocket have been eliminated from this system. We don't use turbo pumps, we use pressure feed instead. We don't have to make major investments in uh, you know, costly turbo pump uh, development uh, or uh, you know, those are also very uh, failure prone. So this is by removing a system like that, we increase the safety of the vehicle itself, and we reduce the number of parts, which also increases the safety. Less things to fail. So uh, the, here. the uh, main driver of this uh, system, again, is the uh, the engine, without an engine, without a rocket engine, you do not have a rocket. So this is a um, prerequisite if you are starting a rocket company. <coughs> the uh, plume you see here, again, this is at our second test site at the Mojave Air and Spaceport. And again, that's, that's roughly 20, 24 feet long, 7,500 pounds of thrust. Uh, and uh, the same propellants, the nitric acid and turpentine. We've developed um, uh, a hypergolic mix, which means that the propellants ignite on contact chemically, uh, and we've developed a green and more friendly uh, set of chemicals to use that to give us the same results of that very poisonous hypergolic chemicals uh, usually do. So we've, we've made it. Uh, friendlier. Uh, that is, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a system that is considered uh, green because of the low levels of pollution in the exhaust products. <clears throat> and the, uh, the uh, method we use for uh, launching is enhanced by the fact that these are considered, these are they're called storable propellants, which means we can, you know, just like you go to the gas station and fill up your tank you know, with gasoline, we can fill up our tanks and let the rocket sit. If you use the commonly available cryogenic propellants like liquid oxygen <clears throat> or, or and kerosene, um, uh, anything that's cryogenic is going to require a great deal of babysitting and um, huge infrastructure in terms of basically large thermos bottles to keep these items super cool. So there's, there's a lot of expense in that as well. And, and, and as I mentioned, we, from the beginning, have been looking at how can we cut costs on these systems. So using storable propellants was one of the main uh, factors that resulted in a tremendous savings and lowering the cost of, uh, 
access to space. Also, we make all these engines here in the U.S., so we're not dependent on uh, foreign engines. And uh, no one can hold us hostage when they decide to uh, you know, jack up the price of, uh, of the engine, you know, a few million, which I've seen happen. And you don't want to be in that situation if your, your business model depends on having a, a certain predictable cost you know, for your equipment. You certainly don't want someone pulling the rug out from under you, under you and uh, you know, charging uh, two to ten times more than you would normally be paying for an engine. So um, we are totally, completely vertically integrated, meaning we make everything from the ground up in our whole system, including the engines, guidance systems, even the satellite. So uh, this is uh, it's quite a bit different from most companies. Uh, there's the uh, CPM 1.0, the first uh, version of, uh, of the, uh, the building block for the Neptune series, and also the booster stage for the Neptune 1. Uh, that's in its first uh, flight test. Uh, as you can see, the guy there up on the, the left is an intern at Interorbital, so that's what you do when you intern for us. <laughs> He's uh, He's really enjoying it, and he's up there buttoning up a, a, a tube sap that is in a payload bay uh, that will be tested in flight. So when we first decided to do uh, the testing and the test flights, we didn't really think that anybody would be interested in flying on a test flight. Well, it turned out that people were clamoring for the places and fighting to get on. So uh, we ended up with, on this first flight, uh, four, uh, four basically prototype uh, satellites that were going to be tested to see how well they survive the rigors of, of, of flight and uh, you know, high Gs and vibration, and to make sure that uh, when the valuable experiments were integrated into them that they would survive, uh, it would survive an actual orbital flight. So um, these items uh, that were placed in the payload bays all came back alive. And uh, when the rocket was recovered by parachute, uh, they were all still ticking and, uh, and uh, returned to their owners. There was um, a, um, one from Boreal Space. <clears throat> Those are the folks who made the uh, light sail, the Planetary Society, and they were working with a new type of radio, so that worked well for them. Uh, one of the experiments was our, our Google Lunar X Prize team with the Synergy Moon. We were one of the five finalists in that contest before it ended. And uh, uh, that was flown successfully. There's also a uh, University of uh, Singapore with their uh, graphene experiment as well. And a, a rather unusual satellite built by John Frusciante of the Red Hot Chili Peppers uh, that was uh, used in a, an advertising campaign to launch his new album. Uh, so when we, uh, we did the um, video component of uh, their big promotional deal that ended with a, uh, uh, a virtual track of the satellite. When the satellite would go over your country, you could download the album for free for like 10 days. Well, anyway, that went on to win every prize at Khan for like the best uh, uh, advertising campaign of the year and the best ads and all these other cool awards. So it was really fun to be part of that. Um, so even a test flight can be very, very useful. This is a, a test firing of another engine. Uh, that big engine you saw firing was the booster engine or the main engine for, for all the uh, Neptune vehicles. Uh, this smaller engine is an upper stage engine. Uh, so it's tinier, 
when you get into, uh, into space, you don't need uh, as much thrust as you need when you're going through the thicker part of the atmosphere. So um, these, uh, these small engines uh, would populate the upper stages of the Neptune vehicle, which is a three or four stage vehicle. Uh, it allows you to, uh, with these smaller engines, direct your payload to a particular spot in orbit or in space. And uh, that same, same propellant combination, but just a tinier engine. But we always like to flight test the engines. And uh, we did that. With, uh, we used that engine to power it. Uh, it, it worked fantastically. There's more payloads on board there. Uh, scientific payloads and uh, some repeat customers, and that, uh, that actually worked very well. So we were pleased with that. Uh, so these are the things, the steps that you have to go through in order to, if you're providing a, a launch service for these small satellites, you have to go through the arduous task of making the rocket well in order to achieve this, this new, uh, well, disruptive price point, which is. Uh, ultra low compared to what uh, was out there today. Uh, part of our philosophy is to, uh, if we don't have something, we make it. Uh, if uh, you know, it's too expensive, we put it together. So um, some of our engineers, it's a very tiny team, usually less than a dozen people working. Uh, we're in a prototype phase. Uh, they've made uh, a carbon composite filament winder to create our low-cost, lightweight tanks uh, that are the body of the rocket and also the propellant tanks. So that, that beautiful pattern that you see on the, on the uh, tank exterior is, uh, is also a uh, high-strength uh, asset to the, uh, to the thing itself. It will give you uh, a, a fantastic amount of, uh, of strength, almost like I think it exceeds steel in some, some ways, but it's much, much, much lighter uh, than, uh, than any kind of steel tank would be. So for rocket purposes, it's perfect. Now they're building a, a 30 foot version of this for the uh, bigger tanks that are coming up. And uh, we're setting up our production line now so that we can turn these out to make our vehicles on demand. Here's a, an example of uh, two types of, uh, of CPMs. So you see the iteration of uh, the one you saw flying is on the left with a new coat of black paint. But that single unit uh, is more expensive to make than the one on the right, which are made of off-the-shelf tubing that are overwrapped with carbon. Uh, and actually, the four tank version gives better performance than the original. So we reduce the cost and we improve the performance, which, uh, which is always good. This is the newest um, CPM, or the newest building block for the Neptune series. <clears throat> the um, four tank model that you see on its mobile launcher uh, being tested and prepared, we were doing water flow tests with this one. Uh, meaning you take uh, water under pressure and run it through the system, and it uh, it will tell you uh, whether there are leaks or whether there's some defect in that system. It's rocket rockets are all about plumbing. I don't know whether you know that, but it's uh, you know it seems very glamorous, uh, but it's uh, it's very basic stuff. Yes, yeah, it's, it's glamorous too. Still, uh, and very exciting stuff. So you uh, would um, be surprised how uh, how you really have to get your hands dirty when you're making rockets. It's 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 quite a quite a thrill. If you don't mind, you do it for the fire and the power. Mm -hmm. uh, various uh, uh, versions of the Neptune vehicles <coughs> are. Um, depicted here. A Neptune 3 is um, a uh, three unit uh, three CPM version of the, uh, the, the basic CPM 
and uh, with uh, two, two upper stages, the tiny ones with those little engines that we showed you. It's, um, uh, that is actually going to be used in a lunar impactor mission. We're doing the first private sector moon mission. Uh, we're working with a renowned uh, trajectory designer, Ed Bell Bruno, and we are uh, planning that for, it looks like, end of 2019-2020. Depends on all how we go through getting our permissions, etc. But that is, uh, we want to be the first private sector company that hits the moon. So even though the Google Lunar X Prize is over, we're still, we're still on our way to the moon as a company and as individuals. Eventually, we'll have uh, uh, a tourist uh, program for the moon, a lunar base, which will be a destination for those tourists and researchers. So this is all part of an evolving uh, business plan, if you will. Uh, the uh, rocket on the right is uh, one version of the uh, N8, or the Neptune 8, which is eight modules. That's the Luna, that's a uh, moon rocket. And uh, also uh, for use in, uh, in other, other missions to other destinations in the solar system. We like Venus a lot. We're very interested in Venus. And uh, I have a, an article on the website that you can take a look at called The Floating Cities of Venus. I think I wrote it in 2004. But it talks about the very special section of the Venusian atmosphere that's Earth-like, high in the clouds. So you might find that interesting. That's, that's one of our objectives. Uh, we do things very, very differently, as I mentioned. Uh, it's not just the vehicles or the way we design things. The whole concept of operations uh, is different. We're looking at ways to do launches that are affordable and, uh, and that will allow us to continue to offer the lowest cost uh, space access in the world. Uh, so that means that we will be avoiding federal spaceports. We'll be launching under US license but we'll be launching from our own self-contained spaceport. Uh, in the case of the image on the left, you see a, a rocket set up in a floating launch position, which is uh, with a ballast unit, about two-thirds uh, submerged in the water. So anywhere there's an ocean, essentially, uh, we would get a license for that latitude and longitude, and uh, then do our, do our launches from there without having to pay the two to four million or more in range fees, without having to wait in the line uh, to, uh, to be allowed to launch. So it's really, uh, it's really quite a different and novel approach. The rockets are able to launch from land on their mobile launchers, but the customer would have to pick up any extra range costs involved in that. Uh, the ocean launch for us gives us launch on demand capabilities rapid response capabilities, and ultra low cost. Uh, there's the N3 again, a little bit more about the, uh, the lunar uh, mission. Uh, it will be an impactor mission, but before the main rocket impacts the moon, we're taking out a secondary payload, which uh, will soft land on the moon. So there's about a roughly a 500 gram allowance there, and uh, we're actually selling that payload space, so anybody who's interested, and you have a half million dollars, let me know. And that's really low when you're looking at lunar delivery. The ultimate goal, which is a moon base at the south pole of the moon, well, that is something that uh, we had in mind when we started the company. Uh, so uh, it's uh, not so far-fetched as you might think. We have lunar uh, missions already in the works, a lunar sample return mission. We pre-sold samples. We're going for that as soon as our permissions come through, probably 2020. And again, eventually, 
we will be sending people to the moon. I hope to be one of them. So this will be, you know, the fulfillment of a lifelong dream. Uh, I say we're space 3.0 because uh, you can look at the original Apollo moon programs that were totally that had no borders in terms of uh, the cost and the, you know, just spend whatever you like, just get this thing done. Really exquisite systems that were created for, for that. Um, and it was defined as space 1.0. Space 2.0, I look at Elon Musk and SpaceX and Jeff Bezos and those, those rockets which are still out of the reach of average people. Uh, so they're, and they're quite also really complicated systems. Uh, that's uh, that's space 2.0. Still, you know, still not attainable. But we in space 3.0 have made space accessible to anybody who wants to go. It's something that can be done by average citizen, by teenagers by the military, by the government, by various corporations, anybody, anybody who wants it. Even if you want an advertising program run on it, that works too. Uh, but just, uh, just to let you know, you know, we're a different kind of company. New Space embraces these types of kind of unusual approaches. And we as a you know, kind of a scrappy sort of pirate company. Take our, take our funding from anywhere we can, as long as it contributes directly to the advancement of our technology. So here's a project that's coming up that we find intriguing, lucrative, and directly applicable to what we're doing, which is the Aussie Invader, which is a rocket car. We're doing a 62,000 pound thrust engine for this car because they want to go from zero to 1,000 miles an hour and break all records. Uh, we're, we're trying to get that run at Edwards. So anybody who has any pool at Edwards, put in a positive word, <laughs> that may happen. And we're, um, we're looking at doing that in 2020. So it's a US and Australian uh, effort to uh, break the world land speed record. But what it will also do is give us at interorbital a fantastically powerful new engine with which we can really, really increase the power of our rockets. Doing the same types of uh, three, five, eight combinations, but with a 62,000 pound thrust engine. So that's going to give us fantastic capability. But at any rate, that's, that's the basic story of, of interorbital. And I can show you uh, some video. Would you like to see some video of rocket firing? I may need your help with you. There are uh, many tests of uh, basic tests, first cryogenic engines that we started with, and then moved to storable engines. There are start and stop tests, throttling tests, and flights. This is what we go through to actually bring a rocket to market.
three, two, one, fire. <laughs> Sometimes you have to do two or three to get it right. So we wanted to measure it more closely. We did another version of the engine. Four, three, Fired it. two, one.
kind of a naive question, but do propellants scale with the size of, of the mass that you're trying to lift off? Is there some scaling effect? Uh, these are all liquid propellants, but what we need more uh, to do more. So if we bundle the uh, tanks together, those are all propellants holding eggs. Mm -hmm. That gives us more of the propellant. So yeah, you have to scale the, uh, the amount of propellant you use to produce the amount of thrust you need. Well, what I was trying to get at is the difference between the kinds of propellants that, say, the current space program uses now and the kinds that you can use with small uh, lift uh, objectives. Is there some difference there? Not really, because these, uh, these propellants are also used by a number of countries uh, for various, uh, various, there's a Russian uh, rocket that flies on these propellants. There's also a North Korean rocket mm -hmm. that flies on these propellants. And uh, it's, uh, it's well established. First of all, uh, when you go to the moon, I'd like to go with you. Yeah. Okay, I'm putting my up, reservation sign up now. today. <laughs> Back to the cylinders and the cubes. How long are they designed to last, and what happens to them after they're used for life? Well, we, we've um, decided upon uh, a, an altitude for the orbit of 310 kilometers. So uh, that gives them, that really determines their lifespan. It, it's a very low Earth orbit, and uh, there's enough there are enough air molecules in there to create some drag. So depending on what the solar weather is like and how much the atmosphere is heating up and expanding, it's going to uh, determine their lifespan. If, it, if there's a lot of solar activity and the atmosphere increases, the drag is going to increase on these. So they're going to last from between three weeks to three months generally is what we predict. If you want something with a higher orbit uh, or a longer lifespan, you have to put it in a higher orbit. That is, uh, say, a 450 to 550 kilometer orbit will give you multiple years of, of life on a satellite. But these are, these are really uh, not generally space hardened. Uh, so you, you benefit by doing your experiment quickly and uh, seeing what's best. I don't know how long they will last, you know, as um, you know, viable mechanisms in the, in the hostile environment of space. What was the altitude of your first rocket you showed and then also on the last one? I think it was about 10,000 feet, and the other one was about 10,000 feet. But we were just testing systems on that. so. The next launch of the neutrino will be for actual altitude. Okay, so have you put the satellite in the orbit No, we're going through licensing now, and that won't be completed until probably, I would guess, sometime between March and June of next year. That's quite a, quite a lengthy process. We still have some uh, flight testing to do as well. So we're testing systems, guidance systems, and uh, deployment systems. Do you expect the uh, licensing to take a uh, shorter period of time as your systems mature? I mean, right now it's a lengthy time. What do you expect it to be, say, two, three, four years out? It's pretty much always set a minimum of six months. We, we, we had one of the first commercial launch licenses in, in the year 2000, so we've gone through the process already. Uh, but this is for orbital launch, so there are a lot more factors and a lot, you know, a lot more things that can go wrong that you have to prepare for. Uh, and to prove to the uh, Office of Commercial Space Transportation that, that you found a way to mitigate any disaster that could you know, possibly happen. So um, it's, it's all about public safety. Uh, and uh, that's uh, uh, once you meet uh, a reasonable level of, uh, of uh, I guess, a maturity in your systems, uh, they will grant a license. Well, launches. Uh, then that it's a known uh, quantity. Yes. Do you envision these uh, small scale satellites to have any medium maneuvering, you know, maybe microprocessors? Yeah, yeah, I, I do. Uh, right now you can you can get some some maneuvering, uh, 
by using momentum wheels, flywheels, or um, uh, magnetic sensors. There are a variety of ways to get them somewhat in line. But there are, um, there are complete uh, attitude control systems that are available for these, these small satellites. And if you're doing something like uh, you know, Earth observation and you want to zone in on a particular area, you have to have uh, attitude control. How many satellites did you say you would just have to be sold to 152. Yes. Will you uh, launch from Mojave? We can't launch from Mojave because that spaceport is designed only for uh, air launch, for uh, airplanes that are carrying a rocket strapped underneath them. And uh, I would, I would ideally, you know, love to launch from Mojave. You know, we could just you know, walk down, uh, you know, a mile or so down the runway, and uh, there's a great place for a launch there. Um, you know, we always ask about it. Maybe someday it'll happen, uh, but I don't know. Uh, we're still, we're still in an area where there's a lot of population, and, uh, uh, but that's, you know, it's dangerous no matter what type of rocket you're launching. Even a rocket strapped to an airplane has its dangers. You know, it's not fail safe. So, uh, just because somebody is doing air launch doesn't automatically mean it's going to be successful. But we launch vertically in the old style, and uh, that has to be done where we can drop stages, uh, and ideally not on people. <laughs> so, uh, the ocean launch is uh, uh, actually the best option for us in the. The FAA likes it as well because it's uh, you know, it's a good thing for public safety, especially with a new rocket. You know, you never know what'll happen until you fly it. So uh, that's always uh, uh, always a consideration, just uh, keeping the public safe. Yes. Your current launches are you doing those out of far? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. We started at the Pacific Rocket Society site, which is next door to that, and that's where we learned our our work. Uh, we had mentors from the great aerospace companies like North American, Marquardt, Rocketdyne, and uh, those people helped us you know, get where we are today. Do you have an idea of how many rockets you've launched so far? Uh, yeah, it's a small amount, I think somewhere seven or eight, but they're, um, you know, each time you launch one, it represents sometimes 10 years of work. So it's not, not a trivial thing. Yes? Uh, is uh, there any plan for doing geosynchronous uh, satellites? Uh, that's, that's possible. It, it's not our market focus right now, but it's, uh, it's definitely in the, in the capability of the types of vehicles that we have designed, and uh, that's that's something that, uh, if there's a need for it, we would certainly visit that. Uh, but we were looking uh, initially uh, uh, at low Earth orbit and then off-world, the moon first. We want to do the lunar and interplanetary missions as a major, major component of our, uh, our program. Uh, for doing things like Earth sensing, uh, are, is a circumpolar orbit with the uh, smaller lifetime satellites to be preferred for, say, the higher geosync like our weather satellites are now? Yeah, it's because of the cost mm -hmm. and uh, the lead time on making one of those uh, huge satellites is, uh, you know, it's tremendous. It's years. And by the time you finish the satellite, sometimes that technology is outdated. So you can get very, very quick turnaround and use the, the absolute freshest tech with the small satellites and also have a, like a, a very, very quick launch cadence to be able to, uh, again, replenish or you know, just completely replace constellations you may have in orbit. Can you imagine as a, a function of an eventual moon base for, for your company? 
well, or uh, for pure tourism, for the view, <laughs> to see the Earth. <coughs> One of my goals is to see the Earth from the moon. Uh, and um, also, as a research station, there are, uh, are uh, many uh, areas of research that can be explored in the low gravity of the moon that would be uh, uh, actually uh, not possible on Earth. We actually want to set up the utilities companies as well that supply that moon base for production of oxygen, life support, uh, gases, propellants, uh, solar energy, and all of the things that, that are needed to establish the moon as an actual viable uh, destination and a permanently inhabited destination. Also, you can do uh, some terrific uh, uh, launches from the moon to other parts of the solar system without having to go through that nasty atmosphere that we have that requires so much energy. Uh, so it would be a, uh, an, easier, an easier lift from the moon. Yes? Do you plan to uh, take your company into a publicly traded company? Well, we're a closely held corporation now, and I, I actually prefer that. Uh, we are uh, we are currently looking at um, uh, selling a portion of the of the company, which we'd never considered doing before. We're trying to raise twenty million dollars currently, so we do have an offer that's happening now. And uh, that is uh, because we want to get our rocket to market quickly, and we want to expand our workforce and also put our production line into operation. So that requires a lot of money quickly. So that's why we're doing it. But in terms of a publicly traded company, I don't think that's in the picture right now. Anyone else? Roland, do you have any sense as to you know, what you expect it to do over, say, the next 10 or 20 or 30 years? Do you expect it to just continue to grow as the popularity of these it's companies continue? It's predicted to grow. Uh, all the studies that we see uh, say that it will, uh, you know, there are billions of dollars estimated in the, uh, the potential launch market, at least in our interest is the launch market. Excuse me one second. And we're, we're expanding, actually we're expanding uh, our satellite division. Uh, so that would be a new, uh, a new uh, sector for us to do custom satellite. 